The design web is a non-linear process with non-linear outcomes and possibilities. Emergent design reflects the flexibility and unexpectedness of cultural emergence. It allows for solutions to emerge that take the design in a new direction. It is organic, responsive, adaptive, fluid, flowing and dynamic. As a design emerges, we continue to weave our way between the anchor points. An attitude of emergence enables us to flow and move with what is arising. It recognises that things are not always as they seem. There's more to discover and be revealed. The process is alchemical with surprises along the day, along the way and the day. Designing regenerative cultures is an ongoing process of emergence, not a permanent destination. It is an invitation for change rather than being exact or prescriptive. Any advice for getting a local group together in our own areas so that we can explore cultural emergence together? Great question. I think, you know, I'd love to see these cultural emergence guilds and circles popping up all over the place. And, um, you know, that's a, a vision that I haven't yet kind of worked out how to manifest. And um, it, it's but it's kind of putting the word out there and seeing who who is there that's interested in doing that who you know like a book club kind of sharing as well but so there's activities and reflective things within the book that people can um you know follow and you could if you get a group together sort of choose one of the principles one of the practices a week and then share with that we're after you know at the end of the week how did that go for you what did we learn through that process um so yeah in terms of finding people i mean obviously we're all a bit more in an online world at the moment and we have got a cultural emergence facebook group i know there's many people here on there already and i'm feeling um to call to from the new year uh, do that weekly reflection process so pick a core routine a practice that we can then reflect on um, over that week so that will be a way of engaging people and then maybe through that you might uh, end up meeting people locally or um, yeah so it's about seeing who's interested in putting the call out and then in terms of using it within your groups as well there's there's a sort of a, a balance between being very open and transparent that you're using it and also not kind of forcing it upon people. There's a lot you can do with the toolkit which you don't necessarily even need to name. You don't need to say to someone, oh, I'm really giving you good listening attention here. That's one of the practices of cultural emergence. They might look at us really strangely if you're doing that. So it's about again about trying to see what's the level of engagement that you want with people there is um two ways of looking at it one is and i think both are appropriate and you can do both simultaneously one is from finding um the people that you um the the permaculture people the people that would be into cultural emergence or like-minded people whatever we like to kind of name them and trying to connect up with them. But then there's also the who, who is actually around me, who is there, what, the, what might they be interested in at the moment and to connect with them and find out what their needs are. What are their limits? What are their struggles at the moment? What are their visions? And to support them and to nourish them by um, listening to their stories, uh, appreciating them, um, hearing where they're at and, and creating a culture between you and your friends, your family, your neighbours that allows something new to grow, new to emerge from that, that maybe, you know, a few months down the line, they might be like, huh, what's, you know, what's happening here? And they might 
be open to discovering more and having it named oh yes I use cultural emergence tools here um, and and then you know into actually exploring that more through using the language through using the body language that that can come about we've asked how do we identify our our tribe our community how do we identify our our mentors yeah it's a it is interesting isn't it but you know it's like how there's many of us that need support in one way or another and it's like uh, again it might be the um you know unexpected people in your community like are there any elders there that you know would love to share their stories and um and, and listen to your questions and give you a kind of wider times perspective as well that don't necessarily have any permaculture experience or um or or are there any you know again we sort of think of mentors as people that are older than us but maybe they're people that have got more experience than us or maybe they're people like the youth or children that can actually give us that mentorship in a in a new kind of refreshing way because they ha aren't so caught in the box of the thinking box that we might be as well so it's about broadening out and also be, being specific maybe there's someone you know maybe if you put out in your networks or on social media or something hey i'm looking for mentoring maybe there's someone who would like to do a co-mentoring relationship with you and just you know listen to you know you swap time so you meet up for an hour and you have half an hour of your time where it's your story and what and your needs and then you swap over and you become the listener and the the person that reflects and asks questions of the other person mm. and I think that's spot on because I have a mentor who's my YouTube mentor and he's 21 and I yeah. have a mentor who is my um, nature connection uh, um, spiritual mentor and she's in her 70s and and so it's horses for courses you know we don't have to expect our our mentors to have all the skills that we perhaps want to gather in our lives so we need to look for mentorship in all sorts of different places and and you know choose wisely and and as you say it, it can have a level of exchange mm -hmm. um, so that it is reciprocal and 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 a give and take i am currently running a facilitation training um, program so actually in the new year we'll be uh, sharing that facilitation network through through our website through the cultural emergence website and launching that and we'll be um, you know I've been training people up in that mentoring and that coaching that one-to-one -one coaching so that that will become available as well in the new year you can understand something on a theoretical level you can understand hey I have had cultural conditioning in my life I can understand that up here, but then that embodied understanding is quite different. You kind of constantly trip yourself up almost and that like, oh, I'm saying something that I thought I'd never say. Where did that phrase come from? Or why am I acting this way where, you know, like in a real scarcity manner when actually I'm thought that I'd really come to an embody an abundance thinking so it, you know it's that embodied understanding is a lifetime's work I think you know that theoretical understanding can come quite quick quickly but that unraveling that conditioning and those beliefs and the values and the thinking and the speech that we have it takes a lot of time <laughs> So just to move on now to just a, a couple of questions around self and community care. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, regenerative self and community care practices that are in cultural emergence? 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's a, a whole phase there of that nourishing power of how we actually use culture and emergence to really fuel ourselves, to really yeah, nourish and empower ourselves and, that we, and, and other people as well, because otherwise we end up sort of just becoming this uh, like a burning out or becoming this kind of activist martyr of like, you know, we're trying to save the world, save the world, but actually, you know, our, our personal health's falling apart or our family dynamics or whatever it is. And it, we do need to balance those two things of, our internal work and our external work and uh, and we need to make it attractive to uh, to become uh, you know uh, to live in a regenerative culture and we need to embody that for ourselves and role model that because there's no you know it's not attractive to the youth to see all these burnt out older people and like yeah yeah go save the planet but I'm exhausted from it and I'm really you know and you know actually we will we need to re revitalize ourselves not just so that we can do more but so that we can enjoy life as well because that's what we're trying you know that's what we're here to do is to enjoy life and the more we role model that the more we um we share that the more we inhabit that the more pe other people are going to want to engage with this and to really see, yes, this is something we, we want to go forth with. And so to, to bring it down to specifics then, Luby, tell us a little bit about how, what your favourite winter practices are. We hinted about embracing the dark rather than cursing it and wishing for the warmer weather in the summer but can you just help talk a little bit about the nourishment that you can receive at this time of year in the northern hemisphere one of the one of the principles we have is um synchronizing with natural patterns and cycles and that is again this embodiment um and this really finding our own rhythm there and you know we have so much cultural conditioning about this like keep going and work nine to five it doesn't matter whether it's summer or winter it's you know the these times and I think um it's you know there's something about how we move into our own rhythms as well and how we you know it's finding that balance between going outside as well I find going outside really useful and you kind of it's suddenly like oh it's four o'clock and I haven't been outside hardly today and it's dark already so really kind of encouraging myself outside um, and also just relaxing into that relaxing into that sleep relaxing into what our bodies naturally feel like doing is is really um, important and using it as this space for doing nothing for dreaming for stillness um and maybe we have more opportunity this year than usual with lockdown um or uh, you know the isolation that, than we normally do to an uh, opportunity to um to be in that darkness and to embrace it Mm. And act like a seed, seeing what emerges from that, but not trying to push that seed open now. It's just allowing it to still be that seed and waiting, waiting for the right conditions for that to emerge in the, in the new year, in the springtime. So from from that practice, that seasonal practice, I want to now pull us all into a, a, a bigger picture how do we best combine social and environmental activism with our inner work? I mean, just that phrasing, isn't it? That they are combined, that we do both of them. And that, that ratio of both of them will be different for each of us. Some of us have more capacity to be out in the world and some of us have... Um, 
you know, more interest and need to do the personal work. And it's just how do we balance those for ourselves and whatever feels right for us. Um, and but recognizing that they are intertwined and that they are balanced and to not be judgmental on other people and what they choose to do, because there is a, a little bit of that judgment you, you know some people are doing too much personal development work or some people are too much out in the world and actually who's for us to say which is needed more or, need, or needed more for a specific person so it's finding our own balance there as well mm. and it's hard you know there's also a rhythm in life where um some some people have the rhythm uh, that they they wake up at a certain time in their life and become engaged as an activist and maybe they weren't in their 20s and then others are really in it in their teens and 20s but maybe when they get to their 60s and 70s they they want to go more into the the forest as you know the tradition in India and be more reflective and we can't make judgments about other people's inner work or their activism and and what they're doing we just need to attend to what's calling us so it's 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 holding though that possibility of emergence while still can within the design process as well and it can be, be a bit of a design trap for people to think, well, it is such an organic emergent process that I can't design it. But actually the design gives you this, this map and this guidance and there's these insights, these layers of insight that allow us to be present within the system. And to, as Do Donella Meadows says, to dance with the system. It, it is such an emergent time um, for us and I think it helps us see these possibilities to, as, as John was talking earlier, to how do we see the blessings in this change, in this collective change process that we're going through and it's, it helps us to find the tools that we need at this moment to recognize uh, uh, and it, it gives a framing them as well of like okay actually there's lots of challenge and awaken what do I, I i what do i personally need to to balance that at the moment do i need to you know find a project do i need to take time out so either move and invigorate or nourish and empower and what do other people need as well at the, as at the moment so it just it provides like this this new map of understanding of what's happening at the moment and a new way of framing that that then gives us doorways and pathways into change into grounding ourselves at the moment because I, I feel that with a lot of people where you know we're we've I call it cultural quicksand that's where we've been and we've we've been in this time where actually these things that were really solid to us beforehand have shifted like even how close or how far away we stand from people that was something that we didn't really we did intuitively we had you know we've had cultural conditioning around that all our lives but we and so to the point where we didn't recognize you know what what it was until we were suddenly like okay you you've got to stand further apart and it's like oh it's it you know you're only far away apart enough if you if it feels awkward to you <laughs> you know um i think that's one of the kind of key things it can do is to really help us to just understand and give a new framing on what's happening for us individually and collectively that then allows us to move forward and move into something else where do you see cultural shifts 
into emergence, most likely to flourish as we emerge in the world from this pandemic? I think, um, I, you know, it's like where I see it happening and where I'd like it to happen might be slightly <laughs> different things. But I think there has been a move for um, more kind of community mindedness happening more you know emphasis on the local and more revaluing and reprioritizing and so I think uh, and I think for all of us we've had this question mark over the status quo and what that means and how that can change dramatically and it's really widened our possibilities for us on a individual level a local level on a political level all these different possibilities have really opened up to us that weren't there before or were in the imagine our imaginations but I'm hoping that there's been a kind of a a stimulating of our imaginations and engagement of like well if all of this has changed so dramatically what else could change as well a couple of quite gritty questions here Luby uh, one is from Christina Ireland um, how do we consciously collaborate co-create and build sustainable community on stolen land in Canada but I think we could just say on stolen land. I feel, um, I feel slightly unqualified to to really sort of say anything about that because, you know, we we live in quite a different cultural landscape in the UK here, and um, that isn't to say that there aren't historically similar problems or. Uh, yeah it's uh, yeah well have you got some words of wisdom to share about that I mean this is such a huge question and and it again um you know I have Irish blood in me and arguably we could say that Ireland has uh, was uh, stolen at one time it's very controversial if we stretch back in time Scotland and Wales you know if it's it's difficult um I think we can only work from where we are and our areas of influence. And for me, there is a lot, um, there is, you know, parts of the book that look at our privilege and, and make it um, overt. And, and I think that is a, a personal and a collective process that we're undergoing at, at the moment that um, we we have deeply unconscious cultural patterns and as we learn and grow within different cultures we we have to address our unconscious violence and and our past history um, the work I do uh, within the Commonwealth is very much based on uh, bringing indigenous people into the room and and around the table uh, instead of talking about sectors of society or, or or parts of nations as if we can colonially go and do good for them um what the the work is to to bring these um groups of people into the room and and give time and space to um, engage with and learn and develop respect for, for different cultures. And also to ensure that if there are regenerative projects that are set up, that they're indigenously led so that uh, we don't send out our permaculture design consultant or our renewable technology person uh, uh, to a country to do good work. We're, we're looking for people within the community with those skills to, to lead the project. And I think that's the fundamental shift 
to to facilitate leadership within um, different cultures rather than go around telling people how they should design their their lives and their cultures and and that's really all I would say because I'm you know very aware that I'm involved in this project but I'm very much um, in a, I'm a very much a student uh, rather than a steward of indigenous rights and I'm at the beginning of my learnings too. As you say, le like levelling privilege is one of the um, practices and I, I think we're all still in the infancy of, of understanding what that really means at, uh, and how to do it. I think we're, we're all really just at the stage of recognising that we need to do it and, and, and that is the, you know, the first step is understanding that we we need to do it and then collectively working out how to do it. How might men learn to care more about what really matters in life? Oh that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> well um, I'm not a man so I don't know but um, it's, uh, it's again about like recognising the different cultures we're part of so being part of the the, the culture of being a man or being part of the culture of being a woman is one of those macro cultures that we're part of. And I mean, just simply asking that question is a good step into working out what to do next and to find ways of caring for ourselves as women, as men, and to come from that. And, you know, maybe asking people that you find really caring and asking them for their tips of like well what you know how do you do it uh, um, and learning from other people and being open to that learning process um, and then recognizing that it is you know it is cultural conditioning and patterning that have led us into valuing or or not valuing uh, qualities such as caring that then you know reinforce each other um so how to uncouple that as well and starting with ourselves and opening up that conversation what is your favorite part of the book what part makes you smile and think i've done well capturing that what are you most proud of well um I'll, I'll <laughs> put her on the spot here. Uh, yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'll come to one of my post-it notes, but one of the things that I wanted to share, which was uh, like an emergent thing of, of from the book, um, like, you know, what, I didn't realise this until the book was published and I had it in my hands, but it's a colouring book. <laughs> it's like I'd spent all this time doing these black and white drawings and anyone who knows me will know that I really love colour but I spent you know months doing these black and white um, drawings and I got the book going and then I was like oh yeah black and white black and white be nice to have some colour and then I realised that everyone that's got the book can do their own colouring and um, and that really made me smile and um yeah, my daughter Taya has done some beautiful psychedelic bees and things in here as well. She's got her own copy. Um, oh, because I because I think that one of the strong strong qualities that you have is that you really embody in your work the principle of emergence. That you are not just an author that inhabits a platform and develops de design systems. You're an enabler of other people's design process. You, you help and empower other people and, and you want to create the conditions of emergence in, in not only your own life, but in the courses that you run, in the way the book's read and colored in. Um, you know, it's 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 a very powerful uh, blessing that you you have and that you share uh, with the world. And for me, that's so important because you know, as an editor, I always feel empowered by working on the projects with you, and yeah. and that's gracious. 
Yeah, thank you. And I, I, you know, that that's something that I've learned through writing people on permacultures. My first book was really like, I don't know where it's going to go next. And I don't need to know. I don't need all the answers to write this. It's like, this is the stepping stone for then other people to take this forward. And I know one of the questions in the chat was, will there be translations? And I know um, the French translation of people and permaculture is coming out soon and it, uh, the Spanish and Dutch one, and there will be, I'm sure be translations of cultural emergence. And uh, that is definitely something I cannot do. <laughs> I'm definitely reliant on other people's skills to, to take that forward. And, and, in other ways as well to take this cultural emergence, take this cool toolkit, take the design process and, and use it, use it as much as we can um, in whatever places we can. Um, and that's gonna be different for everyone. And it's going to be surprising to me to hear all those stories. And I, you know, when I did the design web in, um, in people in permaculture I had, no idea of how many different ways people could design things it was you know really beautiful to see those designs coming up so yeah looking forward to seeing how people can use that in in here and um yeah maybe i'd uh, like to um share um the poem about emergence that came up and that's um may, maybe a good good closing for us, emergence. Life is emergence and emergence is life. The entire history of earth is a story of emergence, of attraction and interaction, of merging and emerging, of relationship building, for collaborating and co-creating, for mystery and surprises. Emergence is provocative and dynamic, exciting and daunting, charismatic, wild and adventurous. It's colorful, messy and graceful, unfathomable and wonderful, organic, elemental, fractal and fluid. It's awe-inspiring, irrational and crazy. Life is arising and surfacing, appearing and birthing, renewing and replenishing, flowing, interacting and opening. Emergence is cosmic and cellular, embodying and connecting. It's paradoxical, reliable and unpredictable, elusive and ever-present. People are emerging culture, sharing, growing, evolving, creating, adapting, stepping up, stepping out, moving along the path of discovery. Cultural emergence opens fields of encouragement, unleashing collective genius to live within the question of humanity. Fertile emergence holds radical potential for humanity's healing, for metamorphosis and shape-shifting within the perfect storm. It's multi-layered, holographic, quantum leaping, belief-bending, rule-defying. Cultural emergence is hopeful and magical.